Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you today to our next webinar in our series. A few things to note, participants will be muted upon entry and videos turned off. Second, for technical assistance, we ask that you use the chat box. Third, you will receive an email in approximately three months requesting feedback and impact on today's presentation. And we also ask that you visit us at www.ncdus.org forward slash training to view other training opportunities. I'll now go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Dr. Martha Perry is the chief of the Adolescent Medicine Section in the Division of General Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine at the UNC School of Medicine. As a board certified adolescent medicine specialist, she provides care for adolescents and young adults with complex medical and psychosocial needs. She completed pediatrics residency at Boston Children's Hospital and Adolescent Medicine Fellowship at UCSF. She has experience working in multiple clinical environments, including school-based health centers, community-based health centers, private practice, and most recently in the academic setting. Her research and teaching focuses on access to reproductive and sexual health, as well as ensuring consent and confidentiality, particularly in marginalized youth. She joined UNC in 2017 to develop a clinical adolescent medicine program, which now provides outpatient specialty care in Greensboro, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, and Sanford, and inpatient consultation care at UNC Children's Hospital and UNC Rex Hospital. I'll now turn things over to today's presenter, Dr. Martha Perry. Thank you, sorry for that delay. I was having a little struggle with my mouse. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about eating disorders in gender diverse youth. Um, our objectives today um, are to understand the prevalence and characteristics of eating disorders in gender diverse youth and to identify some of the risk and protective factors for development of eating disorders in gender diverse youth. We'll finish with developing a gender affirming approach to assessment and management of eating disorders and recommend some resources that families, providers, patients, and others can use to support gender diverse youth who are struggling with disordered eating or eating disorders. First, I think it's really important to talk about terminology. Um, language is imperfect, and there is no term or acronym that is inherently inclusive of all genders. When I refer to gender diverse youth, um, I'm referring to um, youth that recognize identities beyond the binary network. Um, this includes individuals who identify as transgender, non-binary, agender, third gender, metagender, genderqueer, and many more. Um, the terminology is constantly changing, um, and so I typically uh, let folks know that it's good to ask your patients um, what terminology they're using um, and to continually look at some of the resources that I'll share at the end of today's talk to identify the most current terminology. Just to review some of the basics, just in case um, we have an uh, audience that's not as familiar. Uh, first, the cisgender refers to individuals, um, sometimes known as cis, who descri are described as people who identify comfortably with the gender they were assigned at birth. Misgender refers to when language is used um, to identify someone that does not accurately reflect their gender identity, either intentionally or unintentionally. For individuals who are transgender, which um, are individuals whose gender identities don't match the gender they were assigned at birth, being misgendered can be quite painful and distressing. Gender binary refers to the system that allows for the existence of only two genders, uh, man and woman. Binary refers to a person who identifies as either a woman or a man, and non-binary refers to a person who identifies as neither strictly a man or a woman. As we think about um, 
gender identity, it's important to put it in context of gender, sexuality, expression, and biology. Gender identity refers to an individual's sense of their own gender, um, so how they identify as a woman, a man, as a trans woman, a trans man, as non-binary, multiple other identities um, are we, we can review as we go through today. And then sexual orientation refers to those who, uh, refers to who you're attracted to. Um, as you'll see, there's um, some terms that are commonly used listed there. Um, there continue to be a variety of terms that adolescents and um, individuals use to describe who they're attracted to or how they identify in terms of sexuality. Gender expression refers to the way that a person physically communicates their gender identity. Um, oftentimes people think of it as it's demonstrated here um, in terms of a binary nature, meaning someone expresses themselves as either feminine or masculine, um, but clearly it's a spectrum um, and individuals may identify as uh, a trans male and opt to express themselves um, with what some might consider um, more feminine um, based on gender stereotypes. Um, and societal norms. And then biologic sex refers to assigned sex at birth. And this can be based on genitalia observed at birth or um, known either hormones or chromosomes. We're talking about eating disorders in gender diverse youth because um, it's one understudied and um, there's not a lot of validated tools out there for assessment. However, what we do know is that there's a higher prevalence among individuals who identify as transgender or gender diverse compared to cisgender adolescents. And so really important to think about um, that the range that I'm showing here, the two to 18% is probably an underestimate in that um, individuals um, often are marginalized who are gender diverse and may not be getting the care that they need or may not be asked specifically um, about um, eating disorders. Many individuals who are gender diverse are receiving care um, from um, programs that are not um, focused on primary care or programs that are not focused on eating disorders, so may not be asked about eating disorders. And many individuals who are in eating disorder programs may not always be asked about gender identity. So this is why I hope to talk about this today. And I'll highlight a few studies that demonstrate this uh, higher prevalence among gender diverse youth. Um, first is a study that was done in 2013 in Massachusetts. This was an anonymous survey of a random sample of high school students. Um, over 2,000 completed this survey. Um, and as you can see, um, when compared to cisgender males, um, transgender youth um, had higher odds of fasting for more than 24 hours, taking laxatives, using diet pills, and quite strikingly, um, non-prescription steroid use. Um, this probably refers to difficulty with access to care, but really important to think about those odds of disordered eating behavior being um, quite striking and higher than um, in the uh, cisgender males and definitely also higher than um, cisgender females, but more strikingly cisgender males. Then um, the, there was a Canadian study looking at, at youth who presented uh, for gender affirming care um, and assessed um, their um, degree of uh, restrictive eating predominantly, um, and then extrapolated based on the data that they uh, um, uh, collected to determine that, a, that the risk among trans females for restrictive eating was about tenfold, um, and the risk for trans males about 19-fold um, compared to cisgender uh, um, comparison groups. So we know that there's a higher risk of disordered eating behavior, either purging behavior, as I mentioned, um, or a, a restrictive eating behavior, but also really striking is that suicidality, which is higher in gender diverse youth, is particularly high among individuals who have eating disorders um, who are also gender diverse. So 74.8% um, in the American College Health Association, uh, National College Health Assessment, um, who identified as gender diverse reported non-suicidal self-injury. 75.2% reported suicidal ideation, 74.8% reported suicide attempts. Um, when looking at the odds of past year suicide attempts, cisgender, uh, sorry, transgender individuals were 25 times more likely 
than cisgender women with um, EDs to have attempted suicide, and 21 times more likely than transgender people without eating disorders. So individuals with eating disorders um, who identify as transgender or gender diverse are at extremely high risk for uh, mental health um, issues, particularly suicide. Understanding the intersection between gender dysphoria and eating disorders is important. So gender dysphoria refers to that intense dissatisfaction due to mismatch between one's outer self and one's self-perception of gender. And an eating disorder also refers to intense dissatisfaction arising from traditionally distorted perception of or preoccupation with body weight or shape. When thinking about gender dysphoria, we have DSM-5 criteria for diagnosis, and um, typically it's, it's, um, the criteria must be present for at least six months, and there must be two um, of six criteria met. Um, you can see these listed here, but essentially gender dysphoria is a marked incongruence between one's experience and express gender um, and primary or secondary sex characteristics. It's a strong desire to be rid of one's secondary sex characteristics, a strong desire to, um, for the, the secondary sex characteristics of the other gender, a strong desire to be the other gender, um, to be treated as the other gender, um, and a strong conviction that one's typical feelings and reactions um, are more aligned with um, the other gender. So what you see then is that there's this connection between gender dysphoria and eating disorders. There's a mismatch between that inner and outer self that's associated with intense body dissatisfaction. However, what's really important is to recognize the root of the body dissatisfaction that's associated with gender dysphoria. And that's what we're gonna spend a little bit more time focused on. What are the contributing factors related to an individual who identifies as gender diverse um, being at higher risk for an eating disorder. Some of this, as I mentioned, is related to this intense dissatisfaction. So individuals um, may um, engage in disordered eating behavior to decrease or prevent uh, development of the, the secondary sex characteristics that are incongruent with their gender identity. Um, so individuals may start to see curves or start to see uh, development of breast buds or um, even pubic hair that reminds them that their secondary sex characteristics don't match their identity. It's extremely distressing and restricting what they're eating or engaging in some kind of disordered eating behavior may prevent development, further development of those secondary sex characteristics. There's also, unfortunately, um, continues to be lack of access to gender affirming care. Um, some of this is geographical, some of this is financial, some of it are other factors, particularly related to family acceptance, which we'll talk more about um, later on. But this is, a, this is another driving factor behind uh, disordered eating, where there's not access to gender affirming care to hormone treatments or other medications that may help with aligning one's physical appearance with their gender identity. When those, uh, uh, when those resources are absent, um, individuals will resort to other behaviors to improve, um, to um, resolve their gender dysphoria and to um, improve the expression uh, of gender that aligns with their gender identity. Um, the other thing that just is worth mentioning is that um, even those who have gender affirming care early on, um, may have some body dissatisfaction as well. Um, for individuals that present early um, and who are um, brought by uh, family members or caregivers to seek um, care for um, gender dysphoria, individuals may start a GnRH agonist. So this is a puberty blocker, as many of you probably know, and that helps prevent progression of puberty. Um, oftentimes it's started um, at the very beginning of individuals who are um, starting puberty, say Tanner stage two, um, and it prevents further progression, allows them um, several years, um, one to two years often, um, to um, continue to grow um, to some degree, um, but not have secondary sex characteristics develop until they're ready to engage in transition. Either they discontinue the GnRH agonist and progress according to um, their um, sex assigned at birth, or they um, opt to initiate uh, gender affirming hormones 
um, that would allow their gender identity um, to be aligned with their secondary sex characteristics that um, present with the addition of hormones. Um, but in the process of getting to the, the, that point, when they are undergoing um, pubertal suppression, they're oftentimes not experiencing puberty development while the rest of their peers are. So they may be um, uh, smaller they, or they just may have fewer um, signs of secondary sex characteristics than their peers. And this is another contributing factor to developing disordered eating. What's important though to note is that individuals generally who seek care early um, and who um, experience um, GnRH agonists um, as part of their care um, have an overall reduced risk of long-term mental health issues. It's just important to be mindful and screening for eating disorder behaviors in individuals who are on puberty blockers. Of course, another really huge piece of what contributes to individuals with gender dysphoria or who are gender diverse um, developing eating disorders are those societal expectations. Um, these are expectations both in terms of body size and shape, as well as degree of masculinization or feminization. Um, and, you know, we are all bombarded, unfortunately, with images in the media that portray an ideal or portray um, something that is um, actually unachievable. Um, body image um, for most adolescents um, is shaped by really two essential, um, two essential inputs, um, family. So another uh, really important element of um, preventing um, eating disorders or um, helping with eating disorder management is the involvement of family and family acceptance in multiple different ways, but particularly when it comes to um, gender dysphoria, but um, also media exposure. Um, so um, we know that adolescents spend about six to nine hours per day using media, um, mostly social media. Um, these were numbers pre-pandemic. So I actually suspect that it went up during the pandemic. I'm hopeful that as um, things improve, that has um, decreased. Um, we also know that um, social media provides a forum to seek out social acceptance and norms outside the family unit. This is a really important part of adolescent development, um, part of becoming an autonomous adult is gaining um, uh, connection with a community outside of your own. Social media can sometimes be an ideal forum for that, um, especially for individuals who are uh, gender diverse because they may not otherwise find connections locally in their community, depending on where they are and depending on what degree to which they're able to express their gender identity openly within their community. But there is a heavy influence of advertising celebrities, and of course, peers that have airbrushed and photoshopped their images. Um, and this is what creates that unrealistic um, ideal that creates problems for adolescents of um, all genders, but particularly for adolescents who are gender diverse. And this is for several reasons. One is because there is uh, an ideal image, the right here advertised, I believe, maybe Victoria's Secret advertised the perfect body. Um, what kind of message does that send? Um, and then additionally, um, men's products, um, talking about being the real men or being um, ripped or you know, being um, uh, manly in some way. So some um, over feminization or over masculinization that occurs as part of advertising. Um, now, certainly this varies by age and sociocultural or racial perspective. Um, but these images of uh, in advertising and social media often emphasize femininity or masculinity, um, things that may be unachievable for individuals and also completely leaves out individuals who are non binary. Often the images are of individuals who are um, particularly um, men who are um, chiseled or very muscular. Um, my favorite is this commercial here for a yogurt um, where it says I'd rather go naked than get fat. Um, so this is really concerning that there is the pr promotion of these unachievable um, characteristics um, and particularly going to impact individuals who are already struggling with that body dissatisfaction related to being transgender or gender diverse. Then, of course, there's the images that come up, that come up of being 
only being lovable if you have that certain feminized body or celebrities that advertise certain body types um, and certain products that may be unattainable, both from a, um, a financial perspective, as well as, um, again, depending on sex assigned at birth. Um, and certainly um, there is the um, ongoing um, uh, over feminization um, from a variety of very popular um, teen, um, uh, teen products such as uh, Victoria's Secret. Now, the good news is that there has been some positive um, body image attempts um, in advertising. These are ads, um, both underwear ads. Um, but as you'll notice, again, there's still this emphasis on femininity and masculinity. So um, for individuals for whom that is more challenging to achieve, um, or for individuals who are non-binary, that's really excluding them um, and or creating significant um, body dissatisfaction. So where are um, these images that transgender and gender diverse youth can look to? Um, there is this excess of images that portray unattainable bodies, uh, unfortunately, whether cisgender or transgender. Um, in fact, transgender celebrities, while it's um, important that we have um, individuals who are out and who are um, promoting um, support of gender identity, they have access um, to unlimited resources for surgical or cosmetic alterations. So many of these individuals who have been, um, as I mentioned, very public and um, have um, promoted um, gender identity um, affirmation um, have access to resources um, and to uh, photography and probably a little bit of um, photo brushing that um, creates images that are um, oftentimes of, of unachievable um, outcomes for the majority of our population. Um, there is, this is the 2018 um, Pride Portrait Series. Um, and the reason I wanted to share it is that um, it received lots of accolades. Um, and um, partly because it had um, non-binary individuals um, and trans individuals. However, as you'll see, these are all individuals, again, who are in um, smaller bodies who, again, are very muscular and chiseled. Um, so it, it, it creates concern about what kind of body image is being portrayed as the ideal body image. Then when you start thinking about um, other photos that we see of, in, in, of individuals who are transgender or who are gender diverse, um, oftentimes we'll see um, blurred photos or photos of just a symbol with blank backgrounds. So somehow we're not, we're not really seeing um, that, um, that body image that some of our youth who are gender diverse or transgender can um, look to. Um, if this leads to further marginalization. And, and that actually leads me to the next contributing factor when it comes to um, eating disorders is just the, the stress created by being a gender minority youth. Um, listening to folks debate whether or not you are allowed to participate in social institutions that most take for granted can be an incredibly dehumanizing experience. And there can be a lot of anger and or pain that comes with that. That oftentimes then results in individuals um, developing quote unquote coping strategies, many of which may not be healthy coping strategies such as disordered eating. To highlight some of the uh, stress experienced by individuals um, based on their gender minority status, 30% of youth in the 2012 um, human rights campaign survey reported definitely not fitting in. 40% um, had been excluded, harassed, and bullied. Only 30% reported peer acceptance at school, and only 27% reported having very accepting families. So less than a third of gender expansive youth um, in 2012 reported being very accepted by their families. The most important factor with long-term mental health for, for gender diverse youth and certainly related to uh, disordered eating. So that, that's where we then start talking about the um, uh, this gender um, minority uh, stress that's experienced, whether it's stigma, bullying, um, safety. So many individuals um, have to resort to um, particular 
uh, have a lot of stress related to safety. They can't use um, the bathrooms at their schools or um, in public. Um, that may result in not eating or, or drinking in order to forego having to go to the bathroom. Um, and certainly family stress, these all fit in that framework of um, the minority stress theory that basically chronic experiences of stigma, discrimination, and victimization associated with being gender minority create um, the stressors that, that negatively impact behavioral and physical health, ultimately leading to development of, as I mentioned, quote unquote, um, coping behaviors. Um, many of you may know um, the um, Fenway Institute, which has been a leader in um, advancing excellence in transgender health. And I think they do a very effective job of kind of outlining the equation that adds up to development of eating disorders in individuals who are gender diverse. Um, gender dysphoria re causes a significant amount of body dissatisfaction, whether it's related to secondary sex characteristics that are um, particular body parts or um, more generally related to body shape um, or related to um, uh, societal norms or stereotypes associated with gender identity. Um, and then you add in, as, as mentioned, the gender minority stressors, um, such as stigma, um, family rejection, peer rejection, bullying, um, and you um, are a set up, unfortunately, for an eating disorder. So that's where I want to switch to the approach to treatment. That's where we need to think about an equation that includes gender affirming interventions with trauma informed eating disorder treatment so that we achieve recovery. Um, for our individuals who are affected by eating disorders and who identify as gender diverse. This is um, achieved in a variety of different ways, but including um, creating a gender affirming care environment for all of your patients. It starts with signage, it starts with forms that are not gender specific. Um, forms should have parents as opposed to mother, father, or forms should allow for individuals to um, put in their chosen name um, to indicate what their legal name is, however, what their chosen name is. Um, ability to communicate confidentially so that individuals can share what their gender identity is. Um, ensuring that documentation protects that confidentiality becomes really important. Making sure that patients, staff, and family are aware of the consent laws. And probably one of the most important things is staff training. Um, one of the things that I think happens is that medical providers will advertise themselves or um, view themselves as gender affirming providers, but a big part of the experience for patients in the medical setting um, and in um, the um, health professional setting in general um, is with front desk, clinical staff, lab technicians, interpreters, um, multiple others that are involved in care um, that uh, of our, in our very complex healthcare system. And um, unfortunately, about um, a third of individuals report um, having experienced stigma or discrimination in the healthcare setting. Um, and 50% of adolescents reported having to teach their healthcare providers about gender identity. So this is where it becomes really important to make it part of the routine. Um, don't assume, ask every patient. Um, if you're wanting to learn how to ask these questions, if you haven't been asking them, um, it's a simple starting with, I ask everyone these questions and I want you to know this is a safe space to talk. What is your gender identity? What pronouns do you use? Sometimes I get blank looks from adolescents at which times I say, well, my gender identity is female and my pronouns are she, hers. What are yours? Um, certainly we wanna make sure adolescents have that alone time um, because parents oftentimes want to know what's going on with their kids. And at the same time, adolescents actually need that separation. It's part of their developmental process. So being um, careful and cautious about um, having that alone time, making sure that forms are completed privately by the patient become really important, um, giving them an opportunity to indicate somewhere what their gender identity is um, without assuming that the family is aware. As I mentioned, family acceptance is critical in the future well being of individuals who identify as actually LGBTQ, but particularly for individuals who are gender diverse, and particularly when thinking about eating disorders, either in treating the eating disorder 
in individuals with gender with, who are gender diverse or um, in preventing them. Um, so making sure that patients um, have an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one, um, about their experience with their family is really important. Um, clarifying whether they're out to their family or friends becomes the first step. And then asking how you would like them to be referred to when the parent is in the room, if they're not out. Um, making sure that you know how they need to be documented um, in the chart um, and um, letting them know, I'd be happy to talk about resources and support for you if you're interested. Letting them know that you're there to support them um, in and of itself can be an intervention that can make a difference in terms of their future overall health and well being. One of the things that becomes really important as a healthcare provider is ensuring that that family acceptance. Um, is addressed as early as possible. And this is where um, I like to talk a little bit about the family acceptance um, study um, just recently um, that was published. And that's where um, parents and adolescents um, were interviewed um, related to perceptions of act actions that demonstrated support of their gender identity. Um, and what was really interesting is that parents felt like the way that they could most show support was getting resources for their adolescent um, that would allow them to learn more about their gender identity, get support re related to their gender identity, perhaps get hormones, getting them that appointment and getting them those services was viewed by parents as the most important thing that they needed to do and that they thought that their teenager would want them to do. Interestingly, adolescents reported the most important thing was parents using appropriate pronouns. And this is where I will say that um, I find it really interesting where parents will sometimes use the pronoun, appropriate pronouns when the adolescent is present, but revert back to pronouns that um, the adolescent no longer uses when the adolescent's not present. Um, I actually see healthcare providers and other care team providers doing this, and this sets us up for misgendering either um, uh, out of um, disrespect to the individual, um, but also the possibility that they could overhear us. Um, and that's extremely invalidating to know that when you're um, in person referring to them with appropriate pronouns, but when you're when they're not around them, you refer to them differently. Um, if an adolescent were to observe that, that would be even more invalidating than not using the pronouns at all. The role of the primary care provider um, when managing eating disorders in individuals who are gender diverse um, is really critical. Um, first, it's really important to talk about what that, that you recognize what or and explore what may be driving disordered eating behavior. So recognize that the disordered eating behavior may be rooted in wanting to prevent or decrease secondary sex characteristics or to change body size or shape in a way that's less curvy or potentially more muscular or, or bigger or smaller, or in some way trying to match a gender norm or a gender stereotype based on their gender identity. A really important thing also is to prevent gatekeeping of gender needs. Um, I hear very often as a provider, um, parents saying, I think they need to fix their mental health before we start working on the gender issues or other providers saying, we want them to get treated for their eating disorder, and then we can manage the gender issues. These things need to be um, need to be man managed together simultaneously, not mutually exclusive. And that's where it becomes really hard. We really need gender affirming multidisciplinary teams. A therapist that's gender affirming, as well as understands disordered eating. Um, a uh, dietitian, similarly. Um, who is going to be gender affirming and who will be able to provide um, nutritional guidance and understand some of the limitations that an individual um, feels or experiences when asked to gain weight or when asked to um, have return of certain functions that they've been trying to avoid because of how psychologically distressing it is based on their gender identity. And the other thing that a, that a primary care provider can be highly effective in doing is engaging family in acceptance of that combined approach to treatment. Really informing the family that what's most important is that we're gender affirming to your child as well as helping them recover from this eating disorder. We can't do one without the other. We've got to do them together. To help families get to a point where they can provide more acceptance 
it's really important to practice validation of both the adolescent's needs as well as the parents' challenges with meeting those needs. Parents are often confused, mourning what they see as a loss of a child, um, either because of the symptoms and behaviors they observe from the eating disorder, or oftentimes because of an image they had of their child related to gender that's no longer present. And giving individuals a space to mourn that loss is really important, but also giving adolescents space to talk about their needs um, and to validate and acknowledge that you're working towards those becomes very important. Um, this is why providing an opportunity to talk to the adolescent and parents separately is extremely important. Um, parents need to ask questions that sometimes adolescents will hear as invalidating or will um, hear um, in a way that um, makes their recovery um, more difficult. So parents need that opportunity to ask those questions, to ask things like, are hormones reversible? For an adolescent, that's very invalidating. It's saying you don't believe that my gender identity is my true identity, but parents need to understand that to move forward. And so giving them that space to ask those questions becomes very important. And then sharing the evidence with parents about outcomes when adolescents are not supported is probably one of the most important things. We know that parents supporting their child's gender identity is essential for their long-term mental health, both in terms of risk of suicide, but also in terms of eating disorder recovery. And when we know that eating disorder uh, individuals who are, who are gender diverse and have eating disorders are at higher risk of suicide, it's really important to highlight for parents how concerned we are about their child's safety. The other thing that we can do is really assess programs or other providers for their gender friendliness asking what you do to be gender inclusive or giving families this list of questions to ask um, if they're seeking out providers um, on their own. What is your experience working with transgender or gender diverse patients? What kind of training have you or your staff received? What's your clinical approach to providing eating disorder care for gender diverse youth? Again, as I mentioned, we often come across individuals who treat gender diverse youth and provide gender affirming care, but may have very little experience with eating disorder care and vice versa. Individuals who are extremely experienced with eating disorder care, but have very little knowledge or experience with gender, diverse, with gender affirming care. Has the program worked with trans patients before? Um, and if not, would they be open to a consultation from a gender affirming trainer? Um, that's where um, oftentimes um, we're able to help expand access for our patients by um, sharing, again, at the end of this um, uh, slideshow, but um, sharing resources that they can access to learn more about being a gender affirming provider. Um, and then one of the things that's really important, especially for inpatient treatment programs for um, individuals who are gender diverse, is do they consider the patients, but do they um, place the patients and, and um, uh, uh, put the patients in rooms, for example, based on sex assigned at birth or affirmed gender. And what, what about non-binary patients? How do they manage um, patients who identify as non-binary? Non this is also where it's important to ask about bathrooms, important to ask about medication experience. I've had several patients who have been hospitalized for suicidality who also were on um, gender affirming hormones and encountered um, uh, mental health facilities where there wasn't anyone there that felt comfortable um, administering injectable hormones. So being sure if you're referring a patient to a program, an inpatient program, for example, for eating disorders, that if they are on injectable hormones or those are going to be started, that there's someone there that can support them in doing that. Um, what resources do you access when your patients need changes or adjustments to their hormone regimen? Again, um, going back to um, if they're in a program, inpatient or outpatient, how are they gonna get support? How are they gonna get gender affirming support? Um, how will the program engage non-traditional primary supports for patients with limited parent support? Um, this came up recently with a patient of mine that was admitted for um, suicidality who had um, their phone taken away. Um, their sole support of their gender identity um, comes from several close friends, and they had not been able to notify their friends of where they were or um, that they were um, going to be um, in the hospital for a while. Um, and finding a way to allow them with supervision and with caution and, and, and being careful, but to notify their support network where they are and when they might be coming home becomes really important and, and needs to be recognized um, in the setting when there's limited 
parent support? Um, and then what practices do you put in place to ensure that the staff uses the patient's correct pronouns and names? One thing, again, as I mentioned, is making sure that conversations that you're having in case review um, opportunities um, that come up that the correct pronouns are consistently being used. When it comes to treatment goals, this is where um, people sometimes struggle because oftentimes the goal with management of eating disorders is body acceptance or um, body satisfaction, um, learning to love your body. Um, and that is gonna be probably impossible or pretty unrealistic for individuals experiencing gender dysphoria um, or individuals whose identity is not aligned with their sex assigned at birth. So this is where the concept of body neutrality becomes really important. Um, the, this is where we, we really view the body as a vehicle for living and doing. It needs to be nurtured with adequate food, water, rest, and care. The body is a vehicle to get you to the next step. It might be a vehicle to get you to starting hormone treatments, but it has to be, uh, you have to be able to get there. And that means that it has to be nurtured in order to get you there. The other thing that becomes really important is making sure that we're not using growth charts um, or at least sex assigned growth charts as a guide for um, determining what successful treatment is. Um, we really want the guide to be um, focused on intuitive eating um, where an individual, um, instead of focusing on a specific weight or BMI, the goal is that they be able to eat intuitively and free of disordered eating behaviors and exercise in enjoyable ways. And whatever they weigh, when that happens is whatever is the weight, is their healthy weight. Um, and also focusing on signs and symptoms that the eating disorder may be resolving. So that might be resolution of cold intolerance or improvement in, um, or decrease in hair loss or skin changes, um, improvement of mood and focus and sleep and energy. So really looking at how they're feeling physically, how they're feeling emotionally and using those as a guide to um, knowing that you've achieved recovery or that you're going to getting closer to recovery when it comes to the eating disorder management. One of the big things that we use for um, individuals who are assigned female at birth, meaning they were um, identified as female when they were born, um, is return of menses um, as a sign of nutrition repletion. For individuals who identify as transgender or non-binary who were assigned female at birth, return of menses could be extremely distressing and maybe part of what's driving the eating disorder, i.e. preventing that. So looking at means to help prevent return of menses while also promoting um, healthy eating and um, healthy um, behaviors will really um, help that individual engage in eating disorder treatment. Simultaneously, while we're aiming for intuitive eating and a reduction in physical symptoms that are associated with disordered eating, it's important to think about what kind of things we're going to do to support them from a gender care perspective. Um, in terms of their age, a GNRH agonist, as I mentioned before, which is blocking puberty, essentially, it can be administered by injection or administered as um, a, an implant. Um, it really depends on where they are in terms of age and pubertal stage, but this can be uh, really important in terms of putting a pause on puberty and allowing them to um, make it through a few more years um, without the distress of developing secondary sex characteristics and then um, be able to either initiate gender affirming hormones um, to go through puberty that aligns with their gender identity, or um, occasionally they opt to do um, some combination um, in terms of um, stopping the um, GnRH and um, going through um, puberty related to their sex assigned at birth. Um, there are a few potential starting points too to think about. A GnRH agonist, as I mentioned, is one and that you can put a pause on puberty. So they know that you're, you're consciously looking at that. You're, let's just stop puberty for now. Let's focus on your health and let's not have you worry about what's happening in terms of breast development or in terms of um, other uh, physical changes that are um, associated with um, either masculinization or feminization. Um, 
So other potential starting points are things like spironolactone, um, which is an androgen blocker. That helps for individuals who are wanting to remove hair and have slower regrowth or um, less um, male pattern hair growth, um, or something like menstrual suppression, as I mentioned earlier, um, talking about ways to prevent um, periods from occurring. There's a variety of different ways we can do this through long acting reversible contraceptives like an IUD or an Explanon um, or um, oral medications such as norethindrone acetate um, or Depo-Provera um, in the form of injection. Um, so lots of different options and important to think about where everyone's ready to start. But really when you start talking about um, that there are things that can be done to affirm gender um, while they're recovering from their eating disorder can be significantly uh, beneficial in terms of um, helping um, both um, areas of need progress. Um, one thing that sometimes comes up with spironolactone is a concern around electrolyte abnormalities. Um, there's actually been a fair amount of studies looking at um, patients who um, benefit from taking spironolactone without significant electrolyte abnormalities. If someone has those to start or has significant purging, um, sometimes those individuals um, need, require a little bit more monitoring. But if individuals don't have a history of purging and don't have a history of electrolyte um, abnormalities, they don't need any monitoring. The other thing that becomes really important is talking about whether testosterone or estrogen or surgical procedures are things that they are that an individual that you're seeing with who is gender diverse is interested in. So what I typically will say to patients is that I am grateful to be on this journey with you. Um, tell me what you want this journey to look like or tell me what you need this journey to look like. What kinds of things um, are you thinking about or in your future? Um, and that gives them an opening, a very kind of open-ended way to talk about hormone therapy or to talk about surgery. It doesn't mean we're going to do surgery tomorrow or hormones tomorrow, but it allows us to start having the conversation um, so we better understand what their endpoint might be or what direction they're headed. Um, there is no minimum or maximum weight to start testosterone or estrogen. So it is something that can be started um, when someone... Um, is um, in, um, significantly impacted by um, an eating disorder from a medical standpoint, um, and oftentimes is helpful um, in um, uh, improving the disordered eating behaviors and then hence improving the medical stabilization. Um, certainly surgical procedures in particular, there is some degree of uh, medical stability and nutrition that's needed. And that's a great motivator. And that's a really important conversation to have that we want to, we want to accomplish these things um, as soon as we can. And we have to make sure that we know um, that you're going to have um, adequate recovery, that your, um, that your um, skin and, and soft tissues are going to recover from surgery um, without um, uh, complications and without scarring. And part of ensuring that that will happen is adequate nutrition. Um, so that can be a really um, important time uh, to reinforce the importance of nutrition while also validating the long-term goal um, that may include a surgical procedure. The other thing to think about are all the other interventions that can occur, such as social transition. Um, so encouraging families to allow them to try out their chosen name, pronouns, clothing, hairstyles, other things in certain environments if they're not ready to try them out in all environments. Um, thinking about other things such as hair removal, um, breast binding, um, genital tucking or prostheses, um, padding for hips or buttocks. So thinking about ways in which um, we can help with achieving um, gender expression that would decrease the need for um, disordered eating to get those results. Um, changes in name and, and gender marker on identity doc documents are also really important. And all of these really help with validating gender in a way that allows that person to let go of some of the disordered eating behavior, which in some ways may be related to a locus of control, as well as to try to accomplish these things um, at the expense of their health when there's other options that can help them accomplish it without um, a significant cost to their health. Also ensuring that um, we're thinking about um, communication with schools, peers, extended family, um, helping guide um, families and parent, parents with doing that as well as even offering to do it to some degree um, yourself. Again, there's resources at the end of this presentation um, that provide um, information for how to engage with schools or what kind of language to use um, with extended family. 
Um, one of the good things is that there are positive role models who are increasingly um, sharing their stories of disordered eating and body acceptance. Um, here's a list of social media individuals who are prominent, who are um, uh, body positive or body neutral, who are gender diverse, um, who can be um, role models for um, some of our patients as they um, work towards um, recovery themselves. Um, I want to close with um, re-emphasizing this concept of body positivity versus body neutrality um, and thinking about, again, the idea that you can love your legs because they help you run um, and that it doesn't have to be about cellulite or beauty, that bodies are not necessarily about display, um, but more about um, how we use them. And there are gender inclusive images of beauty, which are increasingly um, present um, and um, images that we want to encourage um, our patients to see um, and um, that we want to continue to endorse and support. Um, to close, I think, you know, really important to remember that um, individuals um, who are trans will, will express that they might not be your idea of normal, but instead of the dark clouds you hold so dear, my heart is full of rainbows. Um, so all that we can do to support our patients um, in, in their journey, um, both in recovering from their eating disorder um, while also simultaneously being gender affirming um, can really make the difference between their, uh, frankly, survival. Um, and you as, as providers can, can do a lot to ensure that that happens. Um, as I mentioned, um, I have a fair number of resources that are in the slides that can provide additional information for you, training for you and your staff, um, information for patients and families, um, certainly books to read as well, um, both children's books as well as books for parents, um, adolescent reading lists, um, additionally resources for providers. Um, um, the UCSF um, Trans Health website provides guidance for gender affirming care. Um, it's very um, straightforward and, and relatively easy to follow. And I really encourage individuals to consider um, providing it as part of the other care that they do so that individuals who are gender diverse can get the care they need in one place and, and not experience further marginalization. So, so in summary, gender diverse youth, as, as we mentioned, are at high risk for disordered eating behaviors and, and present um, potentially differently or with different roots um, of the disordered eating behavior. Um, gender affirming friends, family and providers can help reduce the risk of development of the disordered eating as well as support recovery. Um, and while the eating disorder certainly requires intervention, um, what's equally and perhaps even more important is ensuring that this occurs um, with gender related needs also being met. Um, thank you everyone for your time. I, I wanted to make sure we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, so I'll pause and see if there are questions um, and, and or comments. Um, and, and one, there, there are aspects that, that I didn't cover. Um, there are certain eating disorders that may be more prominent um, in certain um, uh, populations, for example, in neurodivergent um, youth who are gender diverse, um, we see a lot more ARFID. Um, there's uh, a lot more we could talk about, um, but I welcome questions and um, hope we can get to answering most of those. Thank you so much for the presentation today, Dr. Perry. We will um, open up for question and answer. If you'd like to post your questions in the Q&A box, I'll go ahead and address those. Um, as a note, we will be sending slides from today's presentation out immediately after the webinar and include a link to an evaluation that we'd like for you to complete. Um, for any questions, you can go ahead and drop those in the Q&A box and we can go ahead and get those addressed. Okay, the first question reads, could you please elaborate on the relationship between GNRH and eating disorders? Did I understand correctly that GNRH potentially causes eating disorders? Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so um, there's really two important um, points related to GNRH agonists. First, um, they do not cause eating disorders. Um, 
but um, we need to have heightened awareness that individuals who have who, who are um, on GnRH agonists may have may not be going through pubertal changes when their peers are. And um, this can sometimes result in disordered eating behavior for a variety of reasons, similar to what we see in cisgender youth who have puberty too early or too late as well. Um, and so we just need to be mindful of that and monitoring for that. Um, when we look overall at the long-term impact of using GnRH agonists and intervening um, when we're able to do that, um, the benefit far outweighs any risk of disordered eating. So generally, we'll see long-term um, fewer um, mental health outcomes that would be concerning, including eating disorders. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. The next question reads, what is the best way to include non-binary individuals in body positivity campaigns? Well, I think that, again, um, that's where I try to really focus on body neutrality um, and less on body positivity um, and thinking about like our bodies are a vehicle for living and um, that um, we, it, it, and some people will look at that as body positivity as well, but thinking about our bodies as a means to an end, as a means to doing the things that we love to do, whether it's, um, uh, attending a concert or going to school or being an artist or um, being an athlete, um, that it all boils down to making sure that we have a body that's able to function and do that, that the, that our internal organs and our, um, our bones and muscles are healthy enough to be able to support all the kinds of activities that we do. Um, I, I think we are seeing an increase in um, non-binary individuals more publicly from a, um, uh, a, an image perspective. The concern that, that I've had and others have had is that um, sometimes the individuals that are, um, are um, most um, popularly portrayed are portrayed in um, smaller bodies um, and um, concern that that some individuals may need to restrict um, in order to achieve that um, body. Um, and so um, rather than focusing on images of others to achieve um, and um, that really we wanna focus more on um, how we use our bodies to um, accomplish in life what we want to accomplish or to enjoy in life what we want to enjoy. That doesn't completely get rid of or undo body um, uh, gender, dysphoria. So I don't want to um, at all sound like I'm saying that that's a solution. It's actually more of a temporary bridge to getting towards um, gender affirming um, care that allows more um, expression and um, treatment that's consistent with our um, our body image, I mean, our, our um, gender identity. I, I don't know if that completely answered your question, um, but please let me know if, if I can further clarify. Thank you once again, Dr. Perry. Um, the next question asks, do you recommend utilizing the NIAS screening tool for RFID in GDY? I work with young adults on college campus as an RDN. Mm. Um, that is a good question. I don't know that I would recommend it as a screening tool, but in individuals who um, who present with disordered eating, it can be a helpful tool. Um, the thing that's important to know, that at least as, as far as this topic, that there haven't been any um, screening tools that were uh, were validated in in really diverse populations, not just gender diverse, but in diverse populations. So many of the tools that we use regularly are tools that have been validated in predominantly uh, white cisgender populations. Um, so that needs some work. Um, that being said, I think if you're cautious and careful about um, how you're using the tools and recognizing some of those limitations, they can be very helpful. Thank you once again, Dr. Perry. And we'll address our last question, which is, you mentioned that physical health stability could be stated to youth wanting surgical procedures. Is mental health also emphasized? 
how can a mental health agency become more gender affirming to support gender diverse adolescents? Yeah, um, that's a tough one. Um, so, um, so, one, so absolutely for surgeons to get approval for surgery, typically there's a requirement to have one or often two mental health providers write a letter stating that, the, that surgery is indicated. Most of the time, those letters are looking at the risks of not doing the surgery, meaning that this individual's mental health will worsen if we do not do this surgery. Um, I think that that's the, the, the general focus that um, surgeons want to know that individual meets criteria for gender dysphoria um, to qualify for surgery. Interestingly, not everybody who's transgender has gender dysphoria. They still may want surgery. So we um, sometimes get into tight spots with that, but but I think that um, that the focus is often in um, using gender affirming care to improve um, mental health, um, but also recognizing that um, there are a variety of additional mental health support services, um, DBT, um, particularly um, some um, methods with um, gender diverse use that can be beneficial. Um, this is, because I'm a medical provider and not a mental health provider, this is probably a little bit beyond my scope, but um, something I'd be happy, some, if, if we have your contact information, I'd be happy to share some resources with you that I am aware of um, that I think um, could help with that. Um, there's some really good things out there and, and more coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. I would like to thank all of you once again for joining today. Um, we truly appreciate it. We'll make sure that you do receive today's presentation um, after the webinar has ended, along with any additional references. Um, Dr. Perry, if you also have additional information that you'd like to share, we can be sure to get that out to everyone um, within a week. Thank you so much and thanks everyone for um, being a part of this today and for being committed to care, particularly of transgender youth because we, we need more providers who are interested and can do it. So I wish everyone good luck and please reach out if we can help and support you in that work. Definitely, thank you all. And a presentation will be available on our website within one week from today for others that you'd like to share today's presentation with. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.